Good evening. This is Professor McGinley. Welcome to the lecture about preterm labor. If, it, if you look at this little one in the corner of the slide, this is what we're trying to prevent when a patient comes in in preterm labor. Make sure that you have watched and listened to the Khan Academy video about premature labor before watching this one. Part one of my lecture addresses the clinical signs and symptoms of preterm labor, and we call it PTL, and the nursing assessment. Part two will cover the management of preterm labor. Let's begin with the definition of preterm labor. Basically, it's the onset of labor prior to 37 weeks gestation. Now remember, in order to get into labor and delivery, a patient has to be at least 20 weeks. We can further define preterm labor as late preterm, which is a gestational age that's between 34 and 36 weeks. We separate these because the 34 to 36 week preterm baby has far fewer problems associated with birth than a fetus that is between 20 and 34 weeks. However, these babies still have a three times higher risk of mortality compared to those that are delivered a term. So we have to watch them carefully. Another term that you will hear is PPROM. And what this stands for is preterm premature rupture of the membranes. When this occurs, it can be with or without contractions. And if we have PPROM, there is an increased risk that labor will begin shortly after rupture. So although the exact cause of preterm labor is difficult to identify, there are many risk factors that increase the chance that a woman will develop preterm labor. If she has a history of preterm labor in a previous pregnancy, even if she eventually went to term, there's an increased risk of PTL with the current pregnancy. Stress can induce preterm labor. Stress can come from the home life, relationships, a job, caring for her own children, being a nursing student, etc. A woman's lifestyle may cause the onset of labor. Smoking is cited as a risk factor, as is drug use. Cocaine use was a common cause of PTL in the late 70s and the 80s. Not only did it cause preterm labor, but it caused abruptio placenta also. This is premature separation of the placenta from the endometrium. The outcomes from these pregnancies were less than optimal. These babies suffered from drug withdrawal as well as the typical problems associated with the preterm delivery. A recent study of common risk factors for the onset of preterm labor determined that the presence of genital tract infections as the most common risk factor. So sexually transmitted diseases like chlamydia, gonorrhea, bacterial vaginosis, previously known as Gardnerella, syphilis, and chorioamnionitis are common causes. And the chorioamnionitis, which is inflammation of the chorion, amnion, and the placenta, is the most common cause of a preterm birth. 40 to 70 percent of births with premature rupture of the membranes or spontaneous labor were as a result of chorioamnionitis. So genital tract infections do not only initiate uterine contractions but can cause preterm premature rupture of the membranes as well. Urinary tract infections cause uterine irritability and increase the risk of developing PTL. For this reason, if a woman develops a UTI early in pregnancy, we treat the current infection for seven days 
then give her a prescription for macrodantin 50 milligrams at HS. A woman who has abnormalities of the uterus, such as fibroids, which are benign muscle tumors, are at risk for developing PTL. If the uterus is over distended due to either overproduction of amniotic fluid, which is termed hydramnios or polyhydramnios, they mean the same thing, or from a multifetal gestation pregnancy like twins, triplets, quadruplets, quintuplets, there is an increased risk for developing preterm labor. Keeping the risk factors in mind, the nurse must interview the patient. Sometimes this interview is by telephone. Patients tend to call labor and delivery instead of their obstetrician because, God forbid, they wake them up in the middle of the night. They know that we nurses are available 24-7, 365. You need to know what to ask the patient. Ask about the EDC, and while talking with the patient, quickly use a gestational age wheel to determine the current gestational age. Ask about the patient's medical history. Are there any red flags that increase the chance of this patient having PTL? Does she have a past history of PTL in this pregnancy or a previous pregnancy? Has she had any procedures done to her cervix that would cause it to weaken with the stress of pregnancy? This would be things like having a laser conization of the cervix because of dysplasia. It causes weakening of the cervix. Also ask, is the baby moving? Is the movement normal for this fetus? And if it isn't, how is it changed? How often are the contractions? How long do they last? When did they start? Where is the actual discomfort? How uncomfortable are the contractions? But don't make decisions about the possibility of a preterm labor solely on the frequency or strength of the uterine contractions. These ladies will fool you. Look in the McKinney textbook in chapter 27 for the subtle signs and symptoms of preterm labor. Your patient doesn't recognize them as possibility of causing changes to her cervix. Does this patient have any pelvic pressure? Is there any bleeding or signs and symptoms of a urinary tract infection? If the responses lean toward the possibility of preterm labor and the patient is at home, err on the side of caution. Have her come to the hospital immediately for evaluation. It is better to have a patient come in, be monitored, have the cervix checked, and end up going home if no labor is present than to have her be in labor at, and deliver at home or present to the hospital in the late stages of labor, and all we can do for her is deliver a preterm infant. So you can ask the questions while you have the patient get into a labor bed, and of course this is assuming you and the patient are face-to-face -face in labor and delivery. Take her vital signs. Is there a fever present? Place her on the fetal monitor. Assess the contraction pattern and the fetal heart rate with variability and for distress. How is this fetus tolerating contractions? Palpate the abdomen. Is there any tenderness? How strong are the contractions? Obtain a clean catch urine and dipstick it for nitrites, protein, and leukocytes because these are what would indicate an infection. If the membranes are not ruptured, assess the cervix for dilation, effacement, and station. If the membranes are ruptured per the patient, then you would also assess any fluid coming from the vagina for burning, which is under the microscope, and or nitrazine positive status. If the pregnancy is between 22 and 34 weeks and the membranes are intact, 
Collect a fetal fibronectin test from the posterior, por, sorry, posterior vaginal fornix. This is done by sterile speculum examination and prior to performing a digital exam. Refer to your prenatal diagnostic tests preclinical preparation document to refresh your memory about this test. The link in the slide provides instructions for how to perform and interpret the FFN quick test. If the test returns as positive, there is a high chance that the patient will deliver within the next two weeks. The hospitalist may do a transvaginal exam to measure cervical length and look for beaking. I'll explain what beaking is in a separate lecture on incompetent cervix. Once the patient is settled in and therapeutic management is decided upon, the nurse needs to let the NICU staff and neonatologist know of this patient's admission and her status. This ends preterm labor part one. Go to preterm labor part two for the management of this common problem.